This video is brought to you by the Deck of Many and Humblewood.net. Welcome back to the Gallant Goblin. I'm Grady. Theo is cleaning up all the candy wrappers from Liar's Night. Today we're covering Wardling's Wave 4, which released October 23rd, 2019. Click the eye in the corner of the screen to see a playlist of all of our Wardling's videos. As you can see, these are packaged and sold individually, with an MSRP of about $7.99, though some places sell them discounted. Wardlings is a universe where children are the heroes with magical abilities and pet companions. Previous waves provided two figures, a boy and a girl, for seven classes that are common in fantasy role-playing games. Each of these playable character figures were accompanied by thematically appropriate pets. Wave 3 also added monster figures like zombies, ghosts, and a troll, with the medium-sized creatures coming two in a pack and large-sized creatures one in a pack. Wave 4 is a bit different, but let's just take a closer look and talk about them as they show up. Each figure comes with a short flavor description on the back, which can be helpful in creating mechanics or lore for them. There are four orcs in this set that come with pets, each representing a different element. I had expected the orcs with pets to be flavored as new hero options, but they seem to be written as villains. You, of course, can do as you like. This description suggests the wind orc fits a rogue or ranger archetype, and if used as a foe, could be a recurring nemesis for your wardling of the same class. The figure is certainly very cool and detailed, riding atop a translucent spell effect, and actually having a quiver with arrows to accompany the wielded bow. The arrow in the bow is a bit bent on ours, but we'll discuss fixing that at the end of the video. Vultures in D&D are challenge rating zero creatures with strong smell and sight. They also have pack tactics and attack with their beak. I had initially thought the vulture was scaled too big, but reading that some vultures can be two to three feet long with wingspans over five feet, this figure is about right. For comparison purposes, here is the mini alongside some other figures from Wardlings and Icons of the Realms. The Fire Orc is another impressive figure wielding a flame sword, flame shield, and flame hair. There are hints of cracked molten rock in the paint job of the belt and shoulder pads, which is appropriate for their volcano homes. This figure might be a counterpart for a fighter wardling or a barbarian if they ever add a figure for that class. The centipede does not have translucent effects, but is a menacing looking creature with matching paint colors. You can adapt the giant centipede stat block from D&D's basic rules with a challenge rating of one quarter and add the heated body effect that you can find in the stat block for a salamander or remoraz, which deals fire damage to creatures in melee range. In a pinch, this mini could stand in for a fire snake, which is a baby salamander. The ice orc is found on mountaintops and attacks travelers and nearby settlements. The figure has an ice axe, as well as a snow and ice effect wielded in the other hand, which could be either the start of a spell or maybe a conjured shield or warhorn. This figure seems like a natural counterpart to the Wardling's druids, especially the girl druid from Wave 2, who also has an arctic theme. There is no ice worm in D&D, but you could build one using the giant centipede again for its base stats to give it a challenge rating of around one quarter. Look to the purple worm or boar worm stat blocks for extra abilities, adding tremor sense or blind sight, as well as the ability to burrow in the ground at half speed, though this creature would not be large enough to leave a tunnel that could be entered, except maybe by a wardling pet. Instead of poison on bite, the ice worm could deal cold damage on bite, with the poisoned and paralyzed conditions remaining that way, but due to frostbite instead. The Mud Orc clans are said to consist of shamans and spellcasters, and the Mud Puppy is a magical familiar. This makes them a good counterpart for Wardling's spellcaster classes, like warlocks, wizards, or clerics. This figure has no translucent spell effects, but is nicely painted with mud on half the face, and runic symbols on the belt and necklace matching those carved into the club and giant warhorn. The mud puppy is quite cute, and while far larger than real-life mud puppies or axolotls, which usually cap out at one and a half feet, the extra scale is justifiable for being a magical familiar, plus it's just plain easier to see on the table. I'd recommend giving the mud puppy the stat block of a mud mephit, found in the monster manual with a challenge rating of one quarter. You should also add a trait to make it amphibious. This orc is the one figure in this wave I have trouble with. It comes by itself, no pet but is medium size, the same scale as the other orcs in this wave. The wielded weapons make the figure slightly bulkier than the other orcs, but it otherwise has no special effects on it and is a standard orc. 
The orc in D&D's basic rules has a challenge rating of one half, but wields a javelin and great axe. This figure has a shield, which gives it extra AC, and a glaive, which grants reach, meaning double the range on melee attacks. It's certainly a nice enough figure, and you can always use more orcs. Like all Worldlings figures, this orc is proportioned slightly differently than Icons of the Realms orcs, and is much more of a pure green, but still fits in reasonably well. The lore for this griffin matches D&D's pretty well, where griffins are also beasts that can be tamed and ridden. As a foe, they can attack twice per turn, once with beak and once with claws. They have sharp eyesight and dark vision and have a challenge rating of 2 in the basic rules. The Nolzers and Reaper Bones lines have unpainted griffins. Pre-painted griffins are harder to come by because they mostly come from lines that as of this recording are hard to find, though they may be restocked at some point. Pathfinder Battles has one in Dungeons Deep, and Icons of the Realms has one in Elemental Evil. There's also some in the older D&D lines pre-icons. As you can see, this griffin is pretty interchangeable with the Elemental Evil one. The griffin cavalry in D&D's Dragon Heist set is much larger, and the rider is not removable. This dragon is presented as an enemy, but quite intelligent and willing to bargain. With its purple coloring, this would fit in with the evil-aligned chromatic dragons of D&D rather than the good-aligned metallic ones. There is no purple dragon in D&D, but this could fit in between the blue and red ones. Pathfinder does have purple dragons, which are the aloof and neutral time dragons. As you can see in these comparisons, this dragon is smaller than large dragons in Pathfinder battles or Icons of the Realms. It's a reasonable size alongside the medium-sized dragons from Elemental Evil, so it could be used as a young dragon. It actually fits in reasonably well alongside this white wormling sculpt as well, if you prefer to use it for the first life stage of a dragon instead. These devils are nightmares incarnate, and use deceptive magic to drive hard bargains. In terms of stat blocks, we've been recommending fairly low-level creatures and stats for most of the Worldlings figures. The safest devil would be an imp with a challenge rating of 1 in the basic rules, though you could go up to a challenge rating 5 Cambion from the Monster Manual. Of course, in appearance, this figure probably most resembles a pit fiend, though smaller in size. But with a challenge rating of 20 in the basic rules, a pit fiend could annihilate even mid-level parties. Apart from a pit fiend, this figure also resembles a Cambion or a Red Abishai, though those are medium-sized creatures, and their minis are smaller than this large-sized devil. I think this is a great set. The elemental orcs add nice variety to orc lore and have fantastic effects. They could be slotted into any setting. All the single mini packs can fit into D&D with minimal homebrewing, except maybe the dragon, but who doesn't like a good dragon? The figures definitely fit in well with existing warlings from previous waves, and there's now a great variety of beasts, fiends, and intelligent foes for your characters to go up against within the line. There's tons of great story opportunities here. The sculpts are all nice and creative and make good use of translucent effects. The only issue I had was the Devil's Trident which arrived bent. This is pretty normal for thin plastic weapons, but a bit disappointing when it comes as a premium single and packaging specifically designed for it, as opposed to the random booster boxes. However, it's easy to fix by running under hot water, bending it back into position, and dunking it into cold water to reset, so it's not a big deal and probably inevitable given the temperature variations these figures go through during shipping and storage. So, as of this recording, we are caught up on Wardling's releases and don't know what's coming next, but hopefully there will be more waves as this line is coming into its own and has nice and colorful figures that add variety to any fantasy tabletop game. There is supposed to be a campaign setting for 5th edition D&D, written by Elisa Teague and published by Renegade Game Studios around the end of 2019, though there hasn't been any major updates since its announcement in March. Our friendly local game store is taking pre-orders for the book, but they don't have a release date either. Let us know in the comments below what you think of this new wave. Are you excited to have a new griffin? Do these elemental orcs spark ideas for your campaign? What new monsters, races, and pets do you want to see in the new wave? Personally, I want kobolds, because you can never have enough kobolds, but I'm sure some of you have more ambitious ideas. We'd like to thank our sponsor, The Deck of Many. Their D&D campaign setting called Humblewood is coming out this month. It features 10 new cute animal races available now in PDF form on humblewood.net, or you can pre-order the print version coming this month, November. 
But since we're talking about minis, let's take a look at another pack of Humblewood minis accompanying the campaign. The Beasts of the Wood pack give you a mountain lion, a forest prowler cat, the terrifying ash snake, and two swarms of ember bats. Are they pets or foes? You decide. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please click that like button and stay tuned for more tabletop and Warlings coverage by subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell icon to be notified when new reviews come out. I hope you're doing well, and we'll see you next time at the Gallant Goblin.